Welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. The series where lengthy detours are intended. No, I don't need a map. Quit telling me to stop and ask for directions. We're not lost. We're sightseeing. And we actually are. Last time we destroyed the ecosystem for a second time by gathering as both a botanist and a miner. With three possible queue distractions under our belt, we have no excuse to complain about queue timers. And just in time two, Dungeons and Trials are going to start being a lot more common as we continue on our journey. Get ready for us to spiral down towards the climax of the base story. When we last left off, we made it to level 30 and the point in the main story quest where Titan has shown his rocky face. This is going to take us a good five levels of story alone. But before we head off to the aft castle in Limsa, I missed one thing at level 30. While Conjurer gets a unicorn and Arcanist has their weird dual job interactions, Archer has something too. After obtaining Bard at level 30, we can head to the Miketo Amphitheater in Gridania. Talking to this blue quest NPC will unlock for us the performance feature. Live out your dreams of being Bongo Cat or playing Kiss from a Rose on Panpipes. That second thing actually exists, by the way. But short detour aside, back to the story. Our first stop is with the Tita Slayer <laughs> to learn as a player how to dodge landslides when a contest comes up. You may notice I skipped basically all of the Frog's quests <laughs> for this video, but this is going to be the trend for basically the rest of the video and possibly most of the videos ahead. And the length of it shows. Well, this shows 19 levels of progress in this video, and some side stuff related to it, it's by far the shortest this series will see. That's because features are going to be much more spread apart, and much less directly connected to the story now. But skipping way ahead now, a little into the Company of Heroes questline, we have a hunt for a turtle that gives us an extremely out of place notice for using items on enemies for quests. This is due to the 5.3 A Realm Reborn rework that deleted some quests. One of them was actually involving this feature. There are some side quests that involve special monsters that are only manageable with such items too, or are otherwise not meant to be randomly fought. This angler in the desert is one such example of a passive enemy involved in these quests. It has a special spiky blue symbol, and he is the aggro version of such symbols. This is actually a main story quest in the 40s. I will be sure to mention it a second time when it comes up, but this mud puppy is basically unkillable without the item. Always read the quest text and it will typically mention the need for such an interaction. But keep progressing the quest line. By the way, I justified all of this for you in another video linked in the card. So if you feel like all of this Company of Heroes stuff is pointless, Finish the section, then go watch that! But eventually, we'll get to our next major dungeon, Brayflock's Longstop. As a healer, this is the first dungeon that will make heavy use of poisons that matter. Thousand Maws had a bunch of them, but were never really all that important. Get ready to Asuna a lot here. Also, small tip I never see people make use of is in the final boss. As a tank, you basically have zero reaction time to make use of this, but on Ayatar, the final boss, you can basically skip his major mechanic with quick reactions. About halfway into the fight, he'll start shooting poison puddles at randomly chosen party members, including the tank. As long as everyone remains loosely spread around the arena, you can watch for when the boss spins around to target you and move away in time to place the poison puddles. Because the tank has basically no reaction time, they can attempt to use a stun instead. Letting the boss stand in these puddles will slowly heal him, possibly more than the team's total DPS if you're all poorly geared or just don't understand your jobs. A quick disengagement like this is going to make the boss go a lot smoother overall, even if he isn't all that hard. Oh, and speaking of jobs, you have absolutely no excuse to not have your job by this point. 
get you a job and be sure to never revert to the class. And don't forget to do your job quests when they come up. I'll be sure to warn you again later for the most important of them. After Brayflox though, we have another jump ahead, all the way to Titan himself. Watch your introduction to the beast and be ready for a mechanic that exists in a total of five fights in the game. Eight counting all difficulty levels. Permadeath. Many, many fights in this game, you can actually fall out of the arena. Five of them, however, the moment you fall off, you cannot be raised. If you fall out of Titan's arena, you are gone until the party wipes and resets the fight completely or clears. So be absolutely sure to dodge his landslides or you'll be taking a one-way trip into the pit for the rest of the fight. Ironically, as the Dragoon, I was the last one alive. So you can stop the little goon jokes now. They're not funny. <laughs> but our victory isn't all laughs. Upon returning to the sands, we see the kinds of turns this game is willing to throw at you out of nowhere. The Waking Sands has been attacked and everyone slaughtered. This is one of the lightest moments like this. It's going to get way, way worse. So be ready to keep some tissues around at all times and steal your heart while you can. Your emotional state will be tested. After dealing with the aftermath, we'll be set upon the next major arc of the base story, the Curthus arc. From 36 to 41, we'll be dealing with the Ishgardians. This is where that Mud Puppy quest comes into play towards the back half of this section. But within this level spread, there are three dungeons. Well, 35 to 41 at least. The first is at 35 with the Sunken Temple of Karn from Nedric Ironheart in Vesper Bay. You probably ended up picking this one up on the way out of carrying the bodies of our allies. <laughs> the next is at 38, over in Uldaw's Sapphire Avenue. Cutter's Cry is one we'll want to keep especially in mind because of our Grand Companies. In the second rank of the Grand Company Hunt Log is Entries for Cutter's Cry. You may think you need to do two runs because of the entry for bats, but no, you can go in solo using the unsync menu. The bats are in the very first room, and you can certainly solo a single bat, even if you are never able to clear alone. Or just do two full runs with a party that whatever works for you, it doesn't matter. But if you don't want to do a second full run, it's easy to solo a single enemy in a dungeon. But before returning to the 41 dungeon that's part of the story, we have a detour back in Wineport for a side feature. At level 36, we can begin treasure hunting. This quest acts as a mini little tutorial on how it works, but there's nothing like the real thing. This one feature here is the biggest reason to have done gatherers already. Nodes above this level will start having treasure maps hidden in them, as I went over in the Gatherer video. Fisher has a specific skill for it, but that doesn't work well and just... No, stop it. Ignore it. It's not, it's not worth it at all. Gather with Miner and Botanist. You can see what the map is before taking it. And this is important because you can only gather one map every 18 hours. So you'll want to carefully pick your map as there's many different types of map. Or just buy off the market board. You could do that, but it may be at a loss due to how maps work and the kind of rewards you get from them. So first step is obtaining a map. Done. Few things. You can carry one of each map at most. The type of skin used is what is specific about each map. Toad skin, goat skin, etc. You can have one of each in your inventory as they are unique. You can't hold, say, two toad skins at once. But you can hold a toad skin, a goat skin, and other skins as long as it is one of each type. Further, deciphering a map will turn it into a key item. You can only have one deciphered map. The type of map it is does not matter. 
The absolute cap is one. So you have to either finish the map you have opened or toss it from your key items. But also, if you decipher, say, a goat skin map, you can pick up a second bottled goat skin. The deciphered map does not count towards the uniqueness of each map type. Looking at this key item will give you a small snippet of a map with the location of the treasure and the area it's in. You could also press the dig button at any time to also bring this up. You have to use your own eyes and context clues to figure out this location. Or look online for map resources. Either way, some maps are easier than others to figure out. This one has some water in the corner, so I know exactly where it is in Eastern Thanalan. This feature massively rewards you for knowing your area geography. Stopping to smell the flowers is now actually profitable. Or again, just use an online resource. But that takes the fun out of it. When you reach where the treasure is located, you can use the dig action to dig it up. Opening the chest will summon enemies of varying strength levels based on the map type. Be sure to read the map description closely before attempting a map. For example, this goat skin map is recommended for solo players at level 45, but maps can recommend a party of 8 level 50 players that you'll need to be very overleveled to do solo. Always keep the listed difficulty in mind. When you open the chest, you'll be rewarded with EXP, money, some items, and possibly some Allegan Tomestones of Poetics. We'll be talking about these quite a lot more later at level 50, but take very, very careful notice of the active help of this one. This is probably the single most crucial active help for a very long time. But head back to our Curthus stuff and meet Stone Vigil at level 41. This is another dungeon with a lengthy cutscene at the final boss that the party may start without you. Hope they're nice and wait for you. But now we're finally transitioning into the Garuda story arc officially. This was all for a ship to reach her, but we need to outfit the ship too. But the moment you start this arc, Beast Tribes, all of them, unlock. As long as you are at least level 44, you can accept every single tribe's quests. There are five of them to pick up. The Exali, Sylphs, Amalja, Kobolds, and Sahagin. All five start with a pair of intro quests. The first to bring you to the tribe's actual location, and the second is an actual intro to the storyline of that tribe. Then, you can actually begin the tribe as a whole. Exali, though, will require you to have a crafter of at least level 1. The Exali are entirely focused on crafting, with a rare quest based on the gatherers to start, but will still require crafting. The rest of the five Realm Reborn tribes are all about fighting. How they work, though, is you'll get three quests a day, per rank of each A Realm Reborn tribe. In Heaven's Word and beyond, it's three quests only per tribe, aside from rank ups. When picking up your daily quests, it will list your current allowances of quests. You get 12 a day, and you can check this in timers anytime you need. Because of this, and because of ranking up bonuses for A Realm Reborn, I recommend leveling all five at once if you can. Obviously enough, because there's only 12 allowances, you can only do four tribes in a specific day, but spread them out as best you can. Ideally, you will invest the most time into the Ixali, because they max out at rank 7, while the other tribes only have four ranks. As such, you'll give three allowances to the Ixali every day, then spread the other nine allowances out between the other four tribes. Also, be warned that if it won't let you pick up new quests on a new day, it's because you didn't do yesterday's quests. You can't have quests from previous days in your journal to do a new day's quests. Reasons to do beast tribes include... Mounts, 
minions, dyes, crafting items, story reasons, glam, and more. And given you get very little reputation per quest, you'll be at this for a very long time. So get started early if they're at all something you're wanting to do. And one more thing, your reputations are all stored in your character profile. Like I said, if you're at all interested, get started early. If nothing else, it's a small bit of EXP for an alt job from 44 to 50. Free leveling for something. And of course, the Exali will level up your crafters a little bit. But alright, back to Garuda. If you are 45 or higher already when you reach Garuda, I recommend doing your level 45 job quest before fighting Garuda. The reward for every job's 45 quest is a set of four pieces of artifact armor based on the job, and it's almost guaranteed to be far stronger than anything else you might be wearing. The boost to your survival and your damage is huge, on top of a new skill like normal. But if you're only level 44, that's fine, worry about it later. But once we actually go into the fight itself, we're in for a treat. This is the third and final four-man trial. There's one more later on, but that's a special case. This is the last normal mode trial in the game, and the story shows just how high the stakes have become as we head into the final arc of the 2.0 story. Get ready for things to become way more intense in future. This is a good time to go deep into our Grand Company benefits. We want to be upgrading our Grand Company rank as much as we can. Leveling Roulette's Roll in Need bonus is a great source of seals, on top of everything else. Also, our second tier of Grand Company Hunt Log requires Cutter's Cry if you don't recall. Then, at 44 and 47, we have more quests from the Commander. Zamil, Darkhold, and Aram Vale. Both of these have normal unlock quests, but will also be asked to do these for Grand Company missions. So don't do them until you have these. Or do do them. It's your game time. Either way, you'll need to do them at least once for your Grand Company. Oh, and these two are the absolute last leveling dungeons of A Realm of Born. There's a lot of dungeons here in 2.0, but Arum Vale marks the last one for leveling. Assuming you've gotten the quest from Nedric and Zamile in the Cursus area, the next instance you should see is at level 50. Back to the Grand Company stuff though, we have the rank of Second Sergeant. I mentioned much earlier in the level 15 to 30 video that I'll be holding onto all of my dungeon drops. Well, this rank gives us Expert Delivery, which allows the trading in of colored rarity gear of most types to your Grand Company for Grand Company seals. In this clip, I got about 10,000 seals just from turning in all this gear I saved. And as you level up, the more seals each piece of gear is worth. The higher the item level, the higher the turn in. But the rewards don't stop there. For maxing out on your purchasable Grand Company upgrades at 2nd Lieutenant, a lot opens up. You may now change Grand Company at any time you'd like by going to the Grand Company and applying to it. The first time is free, and all future times have a hefty cost, but all progress is saved within a Grand Company. You don't even lose your accumulated GC seals. Second, you can now purchase a home for yourself. If there's any to buy. At worst, you can buy an apartment for 500,000 gold, and those are basically infinite, though you'll need to not be on the free trial to do that. You also get a final tier of the Grand Company Hunt Log. And finally, we can talk to the officer one more time to unlock squadrons. I recommend you reading the tutorials inside very closely. I will do a video on these at a later time, mostly because, uh, 
it takes a few weeks to finish them, but they are extremely worthwhile for a side way to run dungeons, personal FC buffs, and more. They're basically fancy retainers, so it doesn't even take a lot of time to get started. The story will send us to more Dona in the next section. Remember that Tomestone active help from Treasure Maps? This is where that was talking about. We don't have nearly enough to buy anything, but we'll be back to this next time. For now, head down and be sure to return to the Aetherite like normal. You may also want to consider changing one of your favorite destinations to this Aetherite. This is going to be your main hub for basically everything at level 50. But in this section of story, there's two things I want to draw your attention to. The quests from Sark Malark, I love that name by the way, give you a set of Garlean Glamour. Put these somewhere safe for the next two quests or so. There's very little story between obtaining these and needing them. The immediate next quest doesn't need them, but once the Stolen Reaper is fixed, you'll need to put it on. Somehow, a lot of newbies misplaced these items in the less than an hour of time between these two events. Don't be one of them. As well, the same quest you need them for, Escape from Castrum Sentry, before starting the solo instance, swap back to your normal gear. No reason not to, and you'll be at a disadvantage if you don't. Which, this solo instance is one of the big notes I want to make. More common than losing their Garlean disguise is people not reading ally text in solo instances. Up top here, your allies clearly state to go find the reason the vanguards are immune to damage. This also pops up in the chat box depending on your filters. Always listen to your allies. They are not going to steer you wrong. And often, like in this case, if you ignore them, it will be literally impossible to win the battle. Believe in your allies, especially because they're programmed to be correct. It's otherwise an extremely easy instance, likely due to the people who might forget to put back on their normal gear and are fighting this in their Garlean armor. But take your time to enjoy the story scenes and Raubon being a badass because he's the coolest. It's time to prepare for the final showdown. We return to the Waking Sands one last time to initiate Operation Archon at level 49. The story quests jump from 47 to 49. If for whatever reason you're not 49, run a quick dungeon. Don't forget leveling roulette exists too. And if you hit 50 before getting to the big event of this quest, go do the 50 quest. But it's not entirely required as Cape Westwind, our intro to 8-man trials, what all trials are from this point on, is extremely easy. The hardest part is not laughing at everyone shitposting about how quote-unquote hard this trial is. Don't worry though, you're going to get to experience harder stuff soon. But after absolutely decimating the first of Gaius' Tribunus, we're gonna head to the front lines in Danilan for the story to hit level 50. When we next come back to this, we're going to have an absolute ton of stuff to go over, to the point that we may need two parts just due to how extreme the number of things we have to go over is. But the Alliance can wait. While they are busy battling all of the Garleans, we're gonna go learn how to craft and make some money. Thank you for watching this bite-sized version of Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. This was a short episode, but like I have said, this is going to have been prep for the biggest section of the series. I will want to do two crafting videos. One of them technically not in this series, a gold saucer video, and likely two videos for level 50 just due to how much there is to do at that point. Just, yeah. There's a lot to do ahead, 
but I'm going to make sure to go through it all one thing at a time. Take care, and may the power of Anna Nidhogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Bubba Lau, Kathy Nock, Lemon, Meowfy, and Nick. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down below in the description. Thanks for watching.